Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. So in continuation of our summer farm tour series, today we are kicking off a series of videos with one of my personal favorites, Osawaga Farm in Connecticut. So in this video, Yoko and Alex talk us through their fertility program as it stands now, uh, about deep composting on their scale and why they pulled back from that system. They talk about making their own compost in small batches and also when they use specialty blends and other fertilizing products, you get to see their compost tea setup uh, and so much more. Such an excellent farm. But before we get into it, just a quick word from today's show sponsor, Neptune's Harvest. When I see my tomatoes getting sluggish or when a tray of some plant or another is, is falling behind, or if I want to add a little nitrogen to a compost pile or to a tea, I've long looked to Neptune's Harvest to help me move things along. They make a wide array of fish fertilizers and other products, most of which are approved for use on certified organic farms like mine. I do not bring in many products at all on my farm, but I always make sure to have at least one Neptune's Harvest fish fertilizer on hand for the growing season. Uh, get 5% off of their products at neptunesharvest.com when you use the offer code NOTILL and or just use the link in the description. Supporting them helps support videos like what you're watching now. Speaking of, let's get to it with Yoko and Alex of Osawaga Farm. Introduce yourself. <laughs> so I'm Yoko Takamura. I'm Alex Carpenter. And we own and operate Asawaga Farm in East Putnam, Connecticut, uh, right by the border of Massachusetts and Rhode Island. We found the property in 2016, and we had two years to prepare the land, build infrastructure, yeah, get situated, start prepping the field. And that was all kind of part of the calculation as well. So I was working on another farm. He was working in a different um, industry. Audio electronics. And yeah, the two years gave us, you know, enough time to visit as many farms as possible and yeah, build out the infrastructure here. So in 2018, we started our first season. When the podcast came out, that was our second season. So now we're in our sixth season and many things have changed. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah, we're growing here on, what do we say now? Under an acre. Inside the fence is just over three quarters of an acre. Um, we have some beds outside where we do some perennials and some flowers, and then we're going to be putting in another high tunnel outside the fence. So pro probably an acre we can say now, yeah. including the hedgerows that are right behind us. Right. Um, yeah. We, uh, we get a lot of questions about the name Osawaga, and we're right on the Five Mile River here, um, which was originally the Osawaga River. And uh, we didn't know what to call the farm when we had found the property, but when we found out about that history, it literally means um, the land in between uh, in the Nipmuc language, who were the native folks here. And so it worked perfectly because we're actually in between two rivers. We're no-till, we've been no-till since the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, we have, uh, 10,000 bed feet? Yes. Right, exactly. Yeah. So 100, 100 foot beds. Yeah. So the calculation is very easy. Yeah. Um, uh, all our beds are 30 inches, um, 12 inch walkways, give or take. Things, things change over time. Um, they're all raised a little bit, but we don't actively raise them. We just broad fork. Our first season, we were half this size. We just had three fields. We have six fields now. The second year, we had six fields, and it's been that way ever since. And uh, just by focusing on the efficiency, um, we've been able to be more profitable every year and grow it, hire more people. Um, I think a lot of times, yeah, people just view like, we have to get bigger, we have to get bigger, we have to grow more. But then you start losing the ability to, to see everything on the farm and, and really focus on the quality over quantity, you know? Mm -hmm. So the people that are on the podcast, a lot are small growers, and it's incredible the amount of food that you can produce. Just, we don't use a tractor in here, so it's all really, really tight spacing. Um, but we're less than an acre, and we're putting out more than some of the bigger farms that are at the uh, farmer's market with us uh, so yeah really just like dial it in and focus on everything and then use that mentality to start to grow I think that's kind of where we're coming from mm -hmm. yeah. one of the biggest things uh, that we've embarked on is just the the soil health um, and looking at the microbiology in the soil so I think year two we were still doing the deep compost method right and we were buying in compost and uh, it's, it's too risky as some of us know um, 
And that was an influence, yes, for us to start making our own compost. But yeah. obviously um, we can't make the amount that we were buying in. So we started focusing really on just the quality of the compost, making small batches that were really high in microbiology and then inoculating our fields with that. So that was a big change. We went from putting down a ton of compost to putting down like two five gallon buckets on a bed and doing things like compost teas, extracts, things like that. Um, and I think that that is something that takes a little bit of time to build up. And that's probably where we saw a huge benefit last year too. Uh, it's helping us become uh, more resilient with climate change, everything else going from those extremely wet years to extremely dry years. Uh, things are, are pretty steady. Um, what else? What else have we changed a lot? So yeah, more cover crops. We make our own compost. I mean, any kind of popular idea, I feel like we've, we've kind of tried. Um, with the living pathways, that didn't really work out. We do have our hedgerow here, which we really like, so that, that this has been good. We want to maximize the productivity of this small space before we would ever think about expanding it. And we still have a long way to go in that. So every year, it's just trying to dial things in, trying to make things tighter, um, addressing any disease issues that popped up the year before, figuring out germination, yeah, if figuring out how grew... to combat pests that pop up. Like we couldn't, we couldn't grow cucumbers for a couple of years, which was heartbreaking. We grow um, Japanese cucumbers and they're amazing. We got everybody hooked on them. They're fantastic. And then the cucumber beetles were just out of control. And last year was the first year that we really came up with a management plan that addressed that. And we had cucumbers for the first time. It was yeah. great. Um, flea beetles, things like that, you know, just trying to, trying to figure out how to make it all work. <laughs> yeah. Um, honestly, I mean, one of the big reasons that we decided to make our own compost was your experience. Um, and I, I'm sure it's a shared experience that a lot of people, but also, you know, in order to afford the amount of compost that you need to get, it's, you can't always get the highest quality. So there's a facility here that is approved by our, um, organic um, certifier. certifier and uh, we got a, a delivery once and it was just loaded with trash there was just plastic water bottles and broken glass and we actually had the vice president of the company came out because we came, complained we were like this is ridiculous you have to see this and uh as he's telling us like the we use eight inch screens to screen it and i'm like pulling like five inch pieces of plastic out of it i'm like you're not and so <laughs> what are, what's in here that we can't see um, is it being tested? Uh, are you making sure that it's going through the proper heat cycling? But that's totally unacceptable, you know what I mean? And for the, for the certifier too, it's like, eh, you know? Um, but, but then when we started thinking about your experience and, and the experience of other farmers dealing with the persistent herbicides and how you could spend years cultivating the space and bringing it up to speed and then just damage it so much, just so quickly, um, we decided to stop and we just stopped cold turkey. Um, we took the soil food web course with uh, Elaine Ingham and that was really eye-opening. It's, uh, it's a bit of an investment, it, but what it, it changed our perspective on things as far as uh, soil health and, and what's going on between the plant roots and the fungi and the bacteria and everything else in the soil and accessing nutrients things like that. So it really changed our perspective um, in how we treat our soil. Uh, we were already treating it well because we're no-till, but um, it, it gave us a lot of tools. We look at things through microscopes. Uh, we wouldn't ever apply anything that we make unless we're sure that it doesn't have pathogens and, and bad guys living in it. Um, and one of the things through that course is she shows you how to make very high quality small batch compost. And we dove right in. We started doing it two years ago. Um, we were making a pile every week. We were using the green waste that was coming out of our fields. We were using uh, leaves and wood chips. And we use, uh, we're lucky that we have friends who have a livestock farm and very, very high quality um, animal welfare approved, non-corn, non-soy, non-GMO. They're just as, as rigid about their animals as we are about our crops, which is awesome. So we get chicken manure from them and that's what we use and we can be absolutely sure. Um, but you can't just go and get, you know, the, the 
uh, stuff from the local horse farm because they're giving them dewormers and antibiotics and things like that. And that's going to wreck the microbiology in the pile. So we were lucky in that respect. And uh, yeah, we just, we dove into it. We, um, we make, we measure it out in five gallon buckets. So every week we'll make a 30 to 40 bucket pile. Uh, 30 is about the minimum we would do. You need the mass in order to keep the heat and, and go through the proper cycling. Um, we mix it all together. The ratio is 10% high nitrogen, which is the chicken manure, 30% green waste, 60% browns, carbon, um, wood chips, leaves, things like that. Uh, so we'll do it in, we'll break it into 10 bucket assortments with that ratio, uh, put it on a tart, mix it all up, load it into a wire cage that's on a pallet, so it's got plenty of oxygen. Uh, we get that up to temperature. So if it's uh, 130 to 150, we cook it for three days. If it's 150 to 160, two days, 160 and up, uh, one day, and then we'll turn it twice. And so every part of that pile is gonna go through that heat treating, heat treating process. It doesn't matter if we're taking diseased tomato plants out and putting it in, we're not worried about it. If we're taking weed seeds and putting it in, they're gonna get denatured. Uh, so it's, it's a very safe way of us to be able to have control over the biology that we're then putting in the field. Yeah, I mean, we'd love to do bulk <clears throat> compost, but I think many farms share this. Um, we just, a like don't have the space um where trucks can access and dump you know ingredients b there's just not a trusted source for like manure and we can't even take municipal leaves the town goes out and they suck up leaves in the fall but there's so much trash in it so we, we actually go out and collect leaves in the fall yeah <laughs> which is crazy yeah it's it's a lot of work yeah. so we do have a bulk pile that we put all the field waste into and then every now and then Alex will come in with a front loader and dump some wood chips down so it's just a little mixture of the you know carbon and nitrogen um, so that just kind of stays there and then either becomes brown material for the early compost piles that we make but one thing I wanted to mention was you know every farm is has a different is in a different um, situation so you know if to start the farm and to build out your field, you might need to do the deep composting mulch, um, especially if you need to boost your organic matter or, or what else. But I think at a certain point is like, do we keep putting down this, this amount of compost season after season? Um, it's great if you have machinery, but if you're doing by wheelbarrows, it's, it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, do you really even need it? I mean, where our organic matter is already at 8%. Um, so it's not, you know, some, some fields might need it for new farmers, but for us, it's not necessary to put down a large amount. What we want is really high quality compost in small amounts that we can um, manage and, mm -hmm. and put down. And so what, becomes you know what finishes in those um, compost piles we use directly on our beds when we prep it so one five gallon bucket per about 50 feet so we just spread it um, but we also so that's just part of the bed prep um, but we also obviously turn it into compost teas and extracts which go even further so um, that's more of a weekly kind of mm -hmm. um, we also do have a sizable worm bin so we're doing vermicompost and we'll mix that in for the teas uh, and one of the, the, the ways that we changed our system um, when we started doing that, when we got away from the deep compost, is we started mulching heavily. We use salt marsh hay. Um, geographically where we are, it's, it's accessible and it's great because any weed seeds that are, that are in it need salt water to germinate. So it's basically a weed-free mulch. And uh, we don't have any science to prove this, but it smells like the ocean and we feel like there's a lot of sea minerals in it too, which is great. Um, we also do a ton of cover crops, like we mentioned. Mm -hmm. So that's keeping our organic matter really high as well. Uh, so yeah, that allowed us to transition away, started using lower applications of really high quality compost, making sure that the soil surface was covered and we're not losing any of that uh, fertility. Yeah, and then, yeah, in terms of fertility, mm -hmm. it is really amazing how little like nitrogen we need to apply to our soils. I mean, on a regular, just a regular crop, maybe 100 pounds per acre of nitrogen, we get away with um, about 30 pounds per acre, especially during the, you know, for the spring and early summer crops. Fall, obviously we need more because most of that nitrogen in the organic matter in the soil is released in June 
I think. Um, and you can kind of see it. Um, things grow really well then. So definitely need a boost in the fall crops, but um, we apply fertilizer for sure. So we used to mix, you know, the nitrogen part and potassium. It just doesn't work with employees. I mean, something that we can do in like 20 seconds, you know, put a little bit of this, put a little bit of that, mix it with the mixer. Um, that just ends up taking way too long with employees. So now we use a blend. Um, it's a never sink blend actually, because we already need, we know we need a lot of potassium. So that was a huge, you know, content of our fertilizer. And his mix already has a lot of potassium and it just, and I don't want that much phosphorus. So it's just a, it's a 617 mix and it's just, yeah. So employees can just grab a, I don't know, a bowl of it and that, that's it. And I'm like, that's, so we just started buying that. We'll see how it goes, but already I think we're saving some time. So, yeah. but the content is mostly, yeah, a little bit of nitrogen, a lot of potassium, a little bit of phosphorus. But we, we also apply, um, some slow release potassium. So we've been adding for the last couple of years, granite meal, just to have a little more baseline, I don't know, potassium that gets released over time, so. And when we were taking the course too, I don't know if you felt this way, but there were no examples of like a small intense vegetable garden using this, right? right. So it was all bigger ranches and it was bigger growers. And we even, through some of the, the Q and A's, we would ask that. Um, and there were no examples. So we're trying to make it work and we're adapting it. We're not doing exactly what we learned in that course. We've kind of made it work for us. And yeah. uh, it's all, I, we'll have to, you know, 10 years out, we'll talk about it again and we'll see what, what has happened. But right now it's a lot of uh, observational and anecdotal evidence. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, think it, I think it is working for us, you know? And it feels good. It feels good to make your own fertility on the farm. Yeah. It feels good to close those loops of not just putting all your green waste in a pile and just letting it rot. Um, mm -hmm. I, we, we feel a lot better about it, which yeah. is important. Yeah, and it's, you know, you take, you go to compost workshops, but it's always so vague. So I do appreciate that she really breaks it down and goes mm -hmm. through every step, and make sure. And then also you're obviously double checking at the end through a microscope, make sure you don't have any bad guys. So yep. like it makes you definitely more confident about making compost and. And we talk about this too. There's so many um, like soil health businesses that yeah. sell products. And it's, they never really tell you what's in it. It's like, oh, you have this problem, buy this product, buy this. We just feel good about like, this makes sense to us and you know, mm. and we can understand it and wrap our like mind around it, so. So yeah, this is where we make our, our high biology compost, um, that soil food web version that we were talking about. And uh, we aim to make a pile a week, 30 or 40 buckets worth. This is a 30 bucket pile. We flipped it once and it uh, came up to temperature yesterday. So uh, in a couple of days, if all goes well, we'll flip it again. And then if all goes well and it comes up again, we'll, uh, that'll be it. We'll uh, let it come back down to ambient. At the height of the season, we can, you can go in as little as three weeks from raw materials to actually applying the compost in the field. Um, so usually by the time we're on our third pile, we're already spreading and making teas and then um, extracts from the first pile. Uh, so once this gets cooking, it's, uh, it's fun. It's uh, a couple times a week we're over here flipping it, making it, and uh, it's just really, like I said earlier about closing the loops on the farm, uh, it's really nice to be turning all this green waste that's coming out of the field into something that's going right back in our field. Um, mm -hmm. It really feels good. Yeah. And uh, that for that alone, for learning how to do this, I think that was worth the, the price of admission for that course we took, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. That learning how to use the microscope. Um, but yeah, basically what we'll do is just put down a tarp right in front of it. Uh, we'll line up all our buckets, get everything pre-soaked. And then uh, we have a couple of manure forks and it's usually like a three person process. One person will be dumping materials in and the other two people will be mixing them up. And once they're nice and mixed, you just start loading it in. Um, put a, there's a post in here that we just drive through the center and then put the tarp on just so uh, if it rains, it doesn't get too saturated or if the sun's out, it doesn't dry out too quickly. I think in the course she would, um, whenever she flipped, 
the pile, she would um, move it to another spot because then she starts building it into that new spot. But we just keep it in the same spot. Have three, if we do a flip, we have three tarps, tarps down all around it. So for instance, for this one, we would maybe put like two in front, one in back, take out the three parts of it, you know, and then rearrange it. So we don't ever have to move its spot. And uh, somebody at our gathering last night, we were talking about compost and they asked us uh, how much of a time investment it is. Uh, Cause it seems like a lot of work. It seems like a lot of time, but it's really not. I mean, we spend building a pile uh, all things told, gathering the materials, getting every, getting everything prepped, uh, maybe an hour mm -hmm. total, and then well, for that's with um, how many people? Uh, at least three. Like three people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, when you go to flip it, um, if you have, it's like a two-person job. If you have two people flipping it, less than half an hour for a flip. Uh, so for the benefits you get out of it, the time investment is very low. Uh, and there's been times where, you know, this is ready when it's ready. So um, there's been times when I've had to flip it when Yoko's at market. And one person can do it. It's not ideal, but it maybe took me an hour or 45 minutes or something. Um, still worth it. So we check the temperature. Un un well, unless the pile fails to come up to temperature, then then that time that that was spent to gather the ingredient. Well, well. So what happens with a failed pile is we use that as the browns for the next pile. So it's not completely going to waste, mm -hmm. but you know, it's kind of. It's, kind it's of annoying. all <laughs> the experience. <laughs> yeah. And if we're only putting, you know, say in a hundred foot bed, we're only putting two five gallon buckets of it. This is a lot of compost. We can do a lot of beds. So um, yeah, totally worth it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. One yes. drawback of this is the earliest you can get it is you can only have enough greens to make a pile in like late May for us anyway, late May at the earliest. Yeah. Um, since we just don't have any green waste coming out of the fields. So, and then from there, it takes like three, four weeks for it to finish. So then the earliest you're getting it is late June. So, or yeah. mid, mid to late June. Mid June, yeah. So, that, you know, if you need compost, like April, May, when you're doing all your big plantings, then that, that's just not gonna, yeah. doesn't work out. So either you make enough um, the, fall, the previous fall. We have had that where, where we have like the last two piles we made we just don't have an application for them in the fall and we just leave them for the winter and then we, we apply them in the spring. Oh, yeah. And then this is our, our worm bin. It's a two by four. Um, eventually it's going to be, if all goes well, a flow through. Uh, a lot of the big commercial scale ones are flow through, meaning you harvest from the bottom. So this has a grate down here and right now there's several layers of cardboard. So when they start to uh, wear through that cardboard, uh, we will hopefully be able to feed in the top and collect the castings in the bottom and have a constant supply. Um, but until that happens, what we've been doing is feeding on one side, all the worms migrate over there. Uh, I just put this on to cap it. Whenever we see um, any fruit flies coming in, I just gave them a ton of strawberries. Um, so they're, they're working on those right now. Um, if you just smother it, then the fruit flies don't, they, they move on, they, they can't. I don't think they can survive. It needs to be like fruit on the surface. Uh, so I just put this down to block any of that. Um, but all the worms are over here where the food is. And now we can take the castings from here and make teas out of them. Um, yeah, this is, this is great. It goes year round. We can feed them in the winter and uh, make teas anytime. So right now we're using this. It's uh, called a bubble snake. This company called Tea Lab makes it. And it's made to fit in a five gallon bucket. So we make five gallon batches at a time. And then we use this little um, air pump right here. So this connects on to the end and it's got all these little holes around it. So it sends big bubbles down to the bottom and agitates it. And we brew it in a, just a clear five gallon bucket. Um, we use a tea bag and we'll put one pound of compost into this, oh. tie it up I'm and then it, the yeah. And then uh, this hangs from this in the bucket. And the idea is you just want um, complete oxygenation. You want just aerobic organisms to survive. Uh, so we'll bubble it for at least 24 hours. And then we'll start checking it under our microscope, which is right here. We have an OMAX microscope that we use. And there's a uh, camera that mounts to it. So if we want to share it with people or take screenshots, 
Um, ideally, with having all of the, uh, the employees, if someone really takes an interest, we can actually train somebody and this can be their job. And then we can start keeping records of the different batches of teas and things like that. Um, but one thing I really like about the teas is that um, because you're feeding it and you're rapidly expanding that biology, it goes like it can change quite a bit and you can tune the tea for what you need. So you brew it for 24 hours, you pull a sample, you look at it on a microscope and it's all bacteria. All you see is bacteria. Um, you learn how to see like good versus bad and you can't tell individual species, but you can tell um, whether they're good bacteria, or bad bacteria. Uh, so 24 hours, all you see is bacteria. Let it go for another 12 hours. You look at it, there's like no bacteria and it's all protozoa. So all the predators and they've been, their population has increased because the prey had increased. So you've got this like sine wave of predator prey. And so if you have a bacterial disease on your leaves, um, you want to spray, like ideally you want to spray a bacteria rich one to coat the leaves, right? But if, if a bacterial infection has landed on your leaves and colonized it, started to impact the plant, you could brew a more heavily protozoa tea and put it on and they'll start to consume all that bacteria. And, uh, you know, this is all, we got to allow a lot of time and, and experience to understand this, but just anecdotally last year, we had our cucumbers had bacterial infection on the leaves and we sprayed it with a tea that was heavier in protozoa. All of those impacted leaves um, turned crispy, fell off, all the new growth came out, never had the disease again. So I think there's something to that. And uh, there's a woman that we worked with that has her own vermicomposting company. She's got all sorts of experiences like that, you know, powdery mildew on the zucchini, spray it, those leaves that were affected, dry, fall off, leaves come back, no powdery mildew. So um, yeah, there's, there's science behind it. It's just, there's not a lot of study being done on it. So maybe in 10 years of doing this, we're gonna have a whole lot of you know, things that we can share. What I like to tell, um, you know, soil-based farmers too, like uh, livestock farmers, a lot of them look under microscopes because you have to identify pathogens. You have to keep your, your animals healthy. I think, I think soil farmers should have that skill. We should be looking at it, you know. It, it's helped us diagnose some issues in our field before that otherwise we would have just said, oh, like it didn't grow well this year. I don't know, maybe next year will be better. But we looked at the soil and we were like, oh, that's why it's not growing well. And then we can address that. So mm -hmm. I think it's an important skill for sure. Everybody needs a microscope. Amazing, right? Just love what those two are up to. And if you want to learn more about some of the styles of no-till they discuss, like deep compost mulching, while supporting our work, you can. You can pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook at notillgrowers.com, or a hat, or other merch, or just go to patreon.com slash notillgrowers and sign up. Or you can just hit that super thanks button, that works too. All of that support literally makes it possible for us to do things like send my partner notillgrowers.com, Jackson, roulette up to see some of the best no-till farms in the country and film them and then make videos like this. Like this video if you like this video. If you are not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. Uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. It's like borderline crazy, like how much cover crops we, <laughs> we grow. And that's one of the things we can talk about later. But we do a lot of cover cropping and you'll, we can walk around and show you.